My grandmother would sit just past this opening in a chair, sipping ice cold water from a mason jar. She wore these gray worn Everlast shorts cut off just, just above the knee. And she wore these baggy t-shirts that would hang over her broad, soft, but very strong shoulders. But she'd sit there right in front of this field and she'd holler at my dad, Jimmy, make sure you keep those rows straight and pull the tomatoes, I'm sorry, pull the dirt over those tomatoes. As a seven-year-old, I thought walking behind the tiller was the coolest thing ever. And if I can be frank, I thought anything that my father did was the coolest thing ever. But I remember walking these fields and smelling the tomatoes. The tomatoes leave such a vivid smell in your nostrils. It's so nostalgic for me. My brother and I and my sisters would, would pick string beans and we would shuck corn and we'd pick apples. We had crab apple trees and pear trees. In return, my grandmother would prepare fried apples and, and canned pears and canned peaches one of my favorite, muscadine grape jelly. I was very privileged because I knew where my food came from. So my name is James Gardner, and there's an elephant in the room right up at the top that I want to address before I get started. Half of you are thinking there's no way that this guy's name is Gardner. Well, my name is James Gardner. The other half of you are thinking, no, he just can't spell. <laughs> no, I, I spell very well. But today I am calling myself the unconventional gardener. Unconventional because, just because the definition of unconventional means not conforming to what is generally done. And then gardener, well, refer to the first elephant for for my last name. So I was privileged coming up. Most peers of mine couldn't tell you where their food came from. They also couldn't tell you that the hairs on the stems of tomato plants were actually called trichomes. So when my grandmother told my father to pull the dirt up over those tomatoes, all she knew was that it would make the plant better. But what I know now is that those hairs that line the stems of the tomato plant are actually indeed called trichomes. They're unicellular and granular in nature. And under the right conditions, each one of those hairs can produce a root that provides stability and nutrition for the plants. But just like those plants and those, uh, just, just like those hairs needing needing support from the dirt, our community and the youth that follow behind me need the same type of support. But oddly enough, field work for my, for my community has been somewhat taboo. Many of our souls are still stained from our ancestors plowing through clay and picking fields of American money. But unfortunately, or actually fortunately, a nation without hunger requires that everyone does their part. So many, so many people before me said, no, my children will never work in a field. And that was unfortunate. So what we've decided, based on experiences in the classroom, I'll tell you, I struggled holding the attention of my students the closer and closer I got to lunch taught high school in the public school system. With every candy wrapper and with every chip bag, heads would turn and conversations would begin. I learned early on that students cannot learn while they are hungry. 
it is a major distraction. When you're teaching, you want, when you're teaching problem solving, I'm a physics guy, I'm a science guy, for all of those that, that love that field, but you want students to be creative when problem solving. You want students to think outside of the norm. But what I learned is that, is that creativity cannot begin until the basic needs of survival are met. So I did what anybody else would do. I went to the drawing board and I decided, how do I fix this problem? My organization, Positive Direction for Youth and Families, decided let's start a garden and we will grow food and grow people. Our core value was growth. Behind every initiative that the organization came up with, if we weren't feeding Greensboro, then we weren't doing our job. So I said, okay, let's do this, and we started a garden. It was December of 2020. Most all of your other nonprofits were closing their doors because of fears of COVID. But myself and a few volunteers armed with curiosity, hope, and YouTube went out to the field <laughs> and we laid ground cover and we built six and a half beds. In Feb that following February, we filled those beds with some soil. Right around that time, we decided to go ahead and start planting. This is actually how we began. Hope, curiosity, and YouTube. I got my children out, we got the community behind us. I'm a little different from most millennials. Most millennials have their stuff together. Or at least if you go to their Facebook feeds, it looks that way, right? <laughs> Typically, people like to just show you highlight reels. But I decided I wanted to bring everybody along with me throughout this journey from day one. So we started out, we planted some seedlings. Everything was looking great. The beds were symmetrical. We were, we were watering. That's another story. I'll tell you guys about that uh, when we chat outside. But we got everything planted. I came out the next week, and there was just a little bit of growth. Not very much, but I was thrilled nonetheless because, hey, this is a community garden. I came out week three, and everything was dead. Six and a half beds, and nothing grew. Absolutely nothing. So I had to reassess and figure out, number one, how do I tell all of my community members that we failed royally? And then, how do we actually grow? Because I'm not going to stop until we feed Greensboro. So I reassessed. And by reassessing, I went back to YouTube. <laughs> and I said, I, I searched out how to start a community garden. You could take community out, but how to start a garden. And I connected with our, some, some local, um, with the cooperative extension here to get some information about what's the best way to start a garden. Now, what I found and what I was given were three things. Now, these three things are rocket science, okay? Several of you have notepads and pens. If you're taking notes, this is what you'll want to write down. Soil, water, and sunlight. Rocket science, but obviously I miss it the first time around. We did not prioritize our soil and our water. Now I had sunlight because I'm out in the middle of a field, so I had one out of the three, but that's still 33%. That's not enough to pass a course. So we prioritized our soil. We connected with the Cooperative Extension to test what we had. We amended those beds, and we started planting again. At the same time, I built 10 more beds because I knew my six and a half, even producing, wouldn't be able to give us what we, what we needed to feed Greensboro. That time, everything took off. We did extremely well. The garden went from absolutely nothing to producing 15 to 20 pounds of food per week. And now that's not just the spring garden. That is spring, summer, and fall gardenings. But we were averaging 15 pounds a week. What was even more exciting was the, com the community involvement. 
What I learned later on was that many of the people who came out to that garden to start with us had never had the pleasure of playing in the dirt. Can you imagine living your whole life and not playing in the dirt or picking up worms? It just, it, it blew my mind. But we were growing food and now we were growing people as well. And we were living out the mission of the community garden. So one of the things that we decided we wanted to do was practice every style of growing that we possibly could in the about two acre space that I'm working on. So we built the beds, those were producing. We started YouTubing no-till gardening and I started experimenting with that. We used grow bags, we had grow towers. We had every example that anybody could ever want to grow in. So if you're living in an apartment and you only have a very small space on your, on your back deck, I have a tower that could feed you salad two or three days a week for the entire growing season. If you have some land but you don't like, you don't have a tiller or you don't, you don't want to do a lot of backbreaking work, we have grow bags. We have all of these examples so that we can show anyone that comes to our garden how to garden. So I said, all of this is great. We are now feeding people and we are now growing people as well. But what if we could create a system where we grow the food, we still continue to give that food away, but we grow the, the people and give them tangible licensure for moving on into another community or planting these gardens in, in, their, in their homes or traveling across the country and managing other facilities. So after doing a bunch of, doing a bunch of research, and, and uh, you know, I, I love YouTube, I told you I'm armed with YouTube, I came up with this idea to try and practice aquaponics. Now, aquaponics is a sustainable form of growing where we couple aquaculture, which is the practice of raising fish, with hydroponics, which is essentially growing plants without soil. So we merge those two together and we get this practice called aquaponics. So I'm responsible for feeding the fish and the fish are responsible for providing the nutrients to the, to the plants. We did that and at the same time, we put a hydroponics tower. I went to work, we built the greenhouse. So the garden began to really, really ramp up. The community was behind us. Our six and a half beds grew to an area over 10,000 square feet of growing and producing food. We started building that greenhouse and I said, I am going to put this aquaponics tank in here and we're gonna practice aquaponics and hydroponics, but we are going to now hire students to come and spend time in our, at our facility to either learn horticulture, learn aquaculture, aquaponics, or hydroponics. And because I'm just a little different from most millennials, I decided to bring the community along with us. So through my failures and through my mistakes, they can all achieve success at the next level. Because we learn by doing. That's one of the things I always practice in, in school was I learned by doing. So we are doing these things and we are successfully doing it and feeding Greensboro. One of the things that really excites me is the growth of the next generation. So many of them have so much potential packed into their little bodies, but they're just eager to have someone come and pull that potential or pull that soil to cover that potential, to give them room to grow at the base, at the core of everything that we do in that garden is growth. Our mission is very simple. The mission is to grow food and to grow people. And we are doing both of those successfully. This is my aquaponics tank. It took me between the greenhouse and the tank, it took me about a year to complete everything. And we are still growing. So I'm in the phase now where I'm planting seeds and trying to grow seedlings to put into this system. So I'm excited about the next, the next step. But even more so, I challenge 
you all, and I challenge the next generation to take on something that they're not familiar with, but bring somebody along with you. And gardening is the best way to do that. So I'm unconventional in just because of the fact that I'm not doing things like I know everything that I'm doing. I am an open book, and I want you all to do the same thing. A garden initially empowers the grower every single time. But when you bring somebody along in your journey, you can actually empower a nation.